indeed, we, we pioneered um, motorcycle taxi e-hailing in, in Lagos and in Nigeria. Uh, we did not pioneer motorcycle uh, taxis in Nigeria or otherwise known as uh, Okada business in Nigeria. That has been going on for, for many, many, many decades. Uh, uh, I think uh, if you do some, some research, you might, there, there are claims that it actually started from, from Benin City. But what we did at Max, uh, Max.ng, is we added a layer on top of that, uh, which is uh, technology. Uh, we, we did that a couple years back. We started actually pioneering uh, e-hailing for Okada, or motorcycle taxis, in 2017. Why did we do that? Uh, we just saw a need. And the need goes beyond just technology. What we found was that safety was a big problem in the industry. Uh, we also found that uh, training and professionalism was mostly lacking in the industry. Now, uh, in, in some of the most developed cities in the world, you might not find a lot of people relying on motorcycles to move around. But that's because they have a lot of other alternatives, you know, like metro systems, very sophisticated bus transit systems that cover the entire city and that are also very affordable and very reliable. But what we found in, in most cities in, in Africa, especially Lagos, you know, Lagos is a mega city. What we found is that there are not a lot of alternate options to move around, especially for the masses. So if, if we ask ourselves and say, okay, how do the masses move around in cities like Lagos? The masses move around in many three ways. Okadas, motorcycle taxis, kekes, which are tuk-tuks, three-wheelers, and minibuses or downfalls. Uh, you and I know that the downfall experience is something else in Lagos. Nobody really likes to use them. Uh, so we looked at Keke and, and Okada and said, okay, how can we begin to reform how this is done? And that's why we started uh, Max Okada. We pioneered uh, Okada Healing in 2017 to train drivers, uh, provide them the right vehicles, and also uh, create a system that also upgrades the dignity of our profession. So is Okada the most ideal form of transportation in a, in a world-class city? Maybe it's not, right? We wouldn't contend with that. But the reality is the reality. This is Africa, this is Lagos, this is Nigeria, where there are not a lot of alternative ways to move around. And people will always use Okada. So if people are going to always use it, then we have to figure out a way to make it safer, make it more professional and make it more secure. And that's why we started Max Okada. When we pioneered you know, uh, Okada Ealing in Okada e in 2017, there were a lot of naysayers uh, who said, oh, this is never going to work. The Okada industry cannot be reformed, you know, and, and so on. But as, as with all, all innovators and as with all, you know, everyone who brings about change, that is something that you, you should expect, you know, it's something that you, you should be used to hearing. Everybody keeps saying it can't be done, you know, until it is done. Then everybody's like, wow, we thought this was impossible. So we knew that from the very get-go. Now, um, However, we did not necessarily ignore all the feedback because when people say it can't be done, they will say it can't be done because of X, Y, Z. So all the reasons that the people gave on why they felt it couldn't be done, we took note of those reasons and said, okay, this is why people feel this can't be done. So let us address this and let us fix this. And some of those reasons were things like, okay, regulation, you know, the government doesn't like Okadas and all that. So we said, okay, then let's go engage the government and work with them and partner with them and see how we can uh, convince them that this industry is better off being reformed than being just left on its own and the government denying that it exists. You know, and that has yielded tremendous results. And uh, now we are on a journey towards actually reforming uh, the Okada industry in Lagos in partnership with the government, which is very exciting. Um, other reasons people gave were things like Okada drivers don't wear helmets. So we made it mandatory for our drivers to wear helmets and we provided incentives to actually drive that behavior. The other reason people gave us that, okay, uh, passengers don't like wearing these helmets because the helmets were the dirty. So we invested in high quality helmets and we also invested in hair nets. So when you, whenever you're wearing a helmet, you first wear a, a hair net, which is one time use, and then you wear the helmet. So, and, and so on, people said, okay, the drivers are not well trained. So we created the driver training academy where we bring in the drivers and we train them, right? So you can see, you know, going step by step, uh, we, we created solutions to all the reasons and all the roadblocks that people felt would prevent us from being able to transform this industry. Uh, and here we are today, there are so many other companies that have jumped on the bandwagon and are trying to do the same thing, which for us is success. When we started the business, at the very beginning, we started with the logistics service only in 2015. We started with three Okadas, or three motorcycles. Uh, by 2017, when we started pioneering the Okada business, at the very beginning, I think we started with about 20 Okadas. 
right? And we've progressively grown to a point where we've onboarded over 1,000 drivers today. Now, at the very beginning, of course, it was hard, it was tough, we, as with all things new. But what we continued to do was to gather a lot of feedback and data from our drivers and also from our users and commuters. And as we continue to work on all that data and the feedback that we were getting, we were using that to improve the quality of the service. Now, while doing this, at the same time, we were presenting and sharing our data with global organizations in the US, uh, in Europe, uh, with our partners all around the world, and showing them that this is a huge market opportunity. Okada, Okadas are almost everywhere, right? But there's an opportunity for us to make it safer and to bring reforms into this industry. And while doing that and providing a social good, at the same time, there's an opportunity to also provide economic benefits and returns to investors over a period of time. So it's not, it's definitely not an industry where you put money in like real estate and you get your money within the same year. No, it doesn't work that way. It requires persistent investments over many, many years for you to be able to see returns because you have to be patient. It's not an industry where you can rush things because lives of people are at stake the lives of drivers are at stake, the lives of our users are at stake. You have to do it carefully. The second thing, or the third thing, is the fact that it is also a regulated industry. Whenever you operate in a regulated industry, you can't rush the government. You can't rush all the stakeholders that are involved. So in our case, it required a lot of work to convince our global partners you know, that this is an opportunity that is worth pursuing. But if I would say something, the hardest thing was not actually convincing them that this opportunity existed because that is pretty self-evident. The hardest part was overcoming some of the, the, the reputation that you know, Nigeria has in the international investment environment. And for that required us to then build relationships over time. So we just didn't go to them the first time and say, hey, we need money from you. You know, we first went to them saying things like, this is what we're doing. We think there's a future here. We think there's an opportunity to make a lot of impact here. Uh, and at some point, we would like you to, you know, come and support, our, support us and work with us. And through several phone calls, several trips all around the world, talking to these people, meeting with them, showing them that, you know, Nigerians are, are great people. Not all the stuff you hear in the news about uh, fraud is true. You know, there are a few, a few people here and there commit fraud. Yes, they do. But that does not represent the authentic Nigerian spirit. The Nigerians are extremely hardworking people. And for some of them, it, it, it only took us to just convince them to visit Lagos. And when they came in, they were like, okay, this is very different from the whole news of war that they're always hearing in the West. You know, they're actually really decent, really smart people here that are working very hard. So for us, attracting investment wasn't just about Okada or the, or, or the market opportunity. It was about getting them comfortable with us as individuals that your investments are safe with us and also convincing them that Nigeria is a place that, is, that you can do business. Nigeria is open for business. Are there challenges? Yes, right? But uh, you know, using examples like, like MTN, you know, like Dangote and all the other big multinationals, Nestle, Unilever, that have come into this country, have invested for many decades and have you know, experienced amazing success, we explain to them that the same can happen you know, with this opportunity as well if you, if you partner with us. So it wasn't easy. Uh, but the, the key learning point for us is because we were persistent, we were consistent, and we were, we were people of our words as well, um, we were able to eventually convince them that Nigeria is the right place and we are the right partners. One of the most powerful things about electric vehicles is their simplicity. The combustion engine has been with us now for how many years? Maybe uh, over 100 years, right? But the, the combustion engine, as, as powerful as it is, has a few key weaknesses. One of the biggest weaknesses is that it pollutes the environment because it uses fossil fuels, petrol, diesel, and so on. The second thing about the combustion engine also is that it is complex. So today, if it is not your carburetor, tomorrow it's your spark plugs, the next day, because there's so many moving parts. The exciting thing about electric mobility and electric vehicles is that they're extremely simple equipment. You will be surprised that 70% of the cost of an electric vehicle is typically the cost of the battery. Now, imagine this, you have an electric motor, you have a battery, you have a chassis, and a few other components, you have an electric vehicle. You can count maybe a total of about, if you abstract the parts, 10 parts equal, equates to one electric vehicle. Unlike a combustion engine vehicle that has literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of parts. So you can see that, first and foremost, the technology is much simpler. The second thing about it is that it is much safer as well. So, the, the, anybody, anybody literally, can get on an electric vehicle and start driving it. All you have to do is just accelerate and brake. Even for a motorcycle as well. You don't need to start figuring out, okay, how do I control the gear? How do I do all, all that stuff? 
it is you can literally learn how to ride an electric motorcycle or keke you can learn how to ride it in one hour no kidding without any prior driving experience so the simplicity of the technology for us is, is, is very important, it's very exciting because it means you know, younger people can, can drive it, women can easily drive it around as well. And maintenance costs, top point is that maintenance costs are much lower. Because it's much simpler technology and the, the parts it doesn't have as many moving parts, it also means that it breaks down much less, much less than you would find in, in other kinds of, uh, in the combustion engine. So the simplicity of the technology, uh, the total cost of ownership over the long term is actually lower. Now the upfront cost of an electric vehicle might be higher because of the cost of the battery, and even that the cost of the battery, cost of cost of batteries are going down every year, right? So today, the economic models that we've built already prove that electric motorcycles and kekes and vehicles ultimately are cheaper than petrol or diesel engine diesel engine vehicles. Now. The practicality of this in Nigeria, because the next question that people typically ask is, you know, there's no electricity in Nigeria. But that is not true. There is electricity in Nigeria. It depends on where you look. So we have factories in Nigeria, we have Dangote factories that run non-stop, that are powered by their own energy, energy assets. I used to work at Nigeria looking for natural gas. I worked there for five years in Bonny Island. There was never any power outage while I was there. Because the, the company ran its own gas-fired turbines that was producing electricity not just for NLNG but for the entire community in Bonny Island. And power never went out. So this is the same country we live in. There are many independent power producers right now that are providing power reliably 24-7 and supplying estates and supplying private businesses. So when you say there's no power in Nigeria, it is just a blanket statement that is not built on fact. So for us, what we've done is we've found power suppliers as well that are going to provide us or that are providing us reliable power to allow us to charge the batteries for electric vehicles wherever we operate them. So um, uh, the fact that there's no power is not true. There's no power for a lot of people, but if you know where to look and you have the resources as well, you can get guaranteed access to electricity even in Nigeria today as we speak. So um, for us, the future is not tomorrow. You know, the future is now. EVs are now. Actually, we'll be uh, investing in, in local assembly uh, because we also believe in creating jobs locally. Uh, that, that's what we stand for. Uh, we don't believe in an excessive import dependent uh, business model where you're just bringing everything in and bringing everything in and you're not contributing uh, to, to the local economy. If you look at you know, what, what uh, uh, Mr. Dangote has done, you know, his business at the very beginning was a trading business and his business has transformed completely into a manufacturing business today. And for us as well, uh, the right thing to do, not just from a business standpoint, but also for the sake of Africa's and Nigeria's development, is to, is to bring as much capacity to manufacture locally as we can. Uh, initially, we would import a few vehicles, but eventually we'll transition very quickly into assembling locally, and then ultimately uh, into building uh, uh, more advanced local assembly and manufacturing capabilities for the vehicles and for the batteries as well. In the next six to 12 months, uh, the, the kinds of innovations that our customers can expect uh, would be definitely access to electric vehicles in a number, in a number of cities in Nigeria. Uh, they, can they can expect to access a much more robust mobile app that allows them to not only do things like accessing vehicles and drivers on demand, they can expect to access all forms of vehicles. So new two-wheel vehicle designs, new futuristic three-wheel vehicle designs, and other things that people want to do with mobile apps like, you know, uh, send money, pay for it, pay utility bills, and all the other basic stuff. We can expect that our, uh, we can our customers and communities can expect to be able to do those things. The other things we also expect to do is to work much more closely with the government as well, to begin to actually help the government reform uh, some of the public transportation systems that they have built and help revive some of them. Uh, now, there are areas where we have, we've identified quick wins, right? So, for example, you want to access some uh, public form of transportation, you should be able to do all that from within, you know, uh, our app, right? So what we're doing is we're not taking a we-only approach to business. We're going to be partnering with as many players as possible in the financial services, in the transportation and in the banking space to build a much more holistic uh, service for, for people. So what can people expect? A much higher quality service, a much larger fleet of drivers, of course. So the response time will be much less. Maybe now if you order for a max driver, maybe it takes 10 minutes for the driver to get to you. Within the next 6 to 12 months, it will take 1 to 2 minutes for you to get a driver. So we are increasing availability. Um, we would also be investing not just in, in the quality of service for customers, but we'll be investing a lot also in our drivers. Providing them much, much, much better healthcare, much better equipment, 
much better training, not just for the job, but training for themselves as individuals. Training on, on you know, financial management, how to manage themselves better. Uh, training on how to prioritize education for their children. Training on their health, how to take care of themselves. Uh, we don't believe in a world where drivers are working 10, 12 hours a day. If you're riding uh, and providing transportation services, you shouldn't do that more than six to eight hours a day uh, because of the impact on your health as well. So we've been investing a lot in building a very strong community for drivers and also investing in, in providing much better high quality of service uh, in terms of the range of services available and also the quality of the vehicles and the form factor, most stylish vehicles for, for our customers uh, around Nigeria and West Africa. Okay, so one, one question that we get a lot of times is about policy. Uh, the policy framework, the regulation environment, and government continuity. Uh, and, you know, what we've seen in the last uh, uh, um, 20 years now, and there are many things that, that have not gone right without the need of democratic dispensation in Nigeria, right? But there are also a number of things that have gone quite good. Especially in a state like Lagos, there has been continuity in governance, right? You haven't found a lot of policies on assault. In, in, in certain areas, maybe you have, but you've just seen that you know Lagos has continued on that part of development. While the the, uh, the risk of policy so and regulatory uh, backtracking always exists in any country in the world, we are fairly confident that Nigeria is on a path uh, towards development, right? And that path will continue into the foreseeable future. So the new governor of Lagos, for example, uh, 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 His Excellency uh, Mr. Mr. Jides Onwolu. Uh, he's coming now, and he's coming, you know, on the back of a. Co he's essentially from the coalition government. He's come on, coming on the back of collective support from, you know, diverse places across the city, right? And when you have governments that evolve out of a, a collective effort like that, you you would typically expect that, that those governments would also pursue ideas that work for the people. Now, our confidence is not so much in the fact that we hope that you know the government, governor, or the president. Or political leaders continue to favor us. That's not really what we're building this on. What we're building this on is that as long as we continue to demonstrate the value, our value to Lagosians and to Nigerians, our political leaders will do the right thing. Or they will even be forced to do the right thing, right? Because no political leader also wants to uh, uh, you know, back uh, 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 frustrate progress, especially when it is very self-evident progress. And in our case, from the sort of uh, approach that we are taking, which is investing in, in drivers, investing in high quality motorcycle transport systems, and ensuring that these people follow, our drivers follow all the laid down rules and regulations with the, of the government, uh, uh, we can only expect that the government would also recognize that this is, this is the way forward. So does policy risk exist? Yes, it does. But we have been very proactive about it. The things that we can control, we can control how our drivers behave, we can control um, uh, the quality of service that we provide. We can control and ensure that we follow the government's directives. Uh, and we are committed to doing all that. So we don't, we don't expect a situation where you know, the government will then go against us. <laughs>